Hey everybody, what's up? This is Ed the Palm Professor here. I'm coming to you from Aqualand, St. Charles, Illinois, also known as the water garden capital of the world. And today we are in for a little bit of a different video. We've done a really good job of talking about construction processes, different techniques for installations, but today I wanna to step it backwards. I wanna show you some of the background information that's necessary for us to create these beautiful water features. That type of information is calculations. I've also had a lot of good feedback from many of you on some of my videos as well as Instagram posts where I actually go over drawings and some of the technical aspects of how we actually specify these projects. So why don't we head on up to the studio so we can get going. <laughs> Alright, so we're up in our studio right now and I'm going to go through the actual drawing for Iguana Land. This particular area over at Iguana Land is kind of in between two of the turtle sections. So he has the Chelonian section on one area and then he has all these other tanks where the aquatic turtles are going to actually live. So this little drainage spot in between is very long and it's very narrow so we want to maximize this space. So my initial thought, I love having lots of curves and things like that. It's going to replicate actually a natural system which is going to be more sinuous. Maybe something like that, approximately. This section over here, this is going to be the pump area. So this is what we call an intake bay. There will be two pump vaults located in there and then a bunch of aqua blocks. So those aqua blocks, it's gonna be the pre-filter for the pond. A pond of this size, you could actually get away with going with two standard skimmer systems, but because it's a zoological organization, because they have a ton of stuff to do, um, I wanna minimize their maintenance. So the way to minimize maintenance is with the pre-filter. So this is gonna capture all incoming debris. The pumps are actually housed down at the bottom. As you have this little foot coming out, kinda of going like that, the pump actually sits down inside of here. You have a pipe coming up, discharging out, and then in front of all this, we have those aqua blocks. On top of the aqua blocks, we're gonna have a big boulder kind of disguising the edge of the pump vault, and then we're gonna have some large river stone going over the top. Now the rubber liner actually goes all the way around all this stuff, and then the water level is right here. So what this is gonna do is the pumps are discharging water out of this vault, water from the pond wants to refill it. All that debris is gonna get sucked into this little catch basin. So the bigger you make this, the longer you can go between maintenance procedures. So this will allow for leaf debris, lawn clippings, any organic compounds, uneaten fish food and things like that to be drawn into this area. Now when they wanna come and do maintenance, what they're gonna do is they're gonna come in here with a net um, or they could actually come in and they could just put something right here, a couple sandbags and they could block all the water flow from going into that. You leave the pumps running, what it does is it sucks all the water out of this entire cavity, and now you can come in with a pressure washer, you could physically remove all of that debris. Okay, so the other things that we have over here, I'm actually gonna have a wetland filter. The wetland filter I didn't even draw on here, that's gonna be situated somewhere over here. So we'll actually have pipes coming from here over to our wetland. The water then is gonna fill up the filter, and then it's gonna flow directly back into the pond. All the water flow is gonna come back into this direction. Now, if you notice, we do have two pump faults. The other one is actually gonna discharge water into a couple strategic areas. This particular project, the entire idea behind it, because it's down in South Florida, I wanna mimic the Everglades because the Everglades is really the driving force for all of Florida. Water that falls from rainwater over in the central area of Florida flows through this massive river system. It's very, very slow flowing and it flows through all types of aquatic vegetation and reeds and there's deep pockets and holes and things like that. So it's just a giant mass of floating water and then it enters back into the Gulf of Mexico. What I wanna do is I wanna shrink that that philosophy and concept down and I want to kind of recreate that because we're trying to create a really cool native habitat here. So that wetland filter is kind of like the springs of northern Florida. If you've ever been over into Florida, you have a high amount of groundwater popping up. So you have all this beautiful, I mean, the snorkeling there, unbelievable. If you ever have a chance, you definitely have to take advantage of it. We have all this upwelling of water. 
we're mimicking that with our wetland filtration. We're gonna have rock and gravel and different types of aquatic vegetation growing in that filter. It's an upflow biological filter. It's gonna detoxify the water. All that water is gonna re-enter back into the pond. It's gonna continue flowing all the way over to our pump area. The second pump that we're adding in is just to increase that circulation. Another thing that I wanna point out here, this little bump out right here, my thought right now is possibly coming in here with uh, creating a deck. The reason being is because we can cantilever it out over the water and it creates a really cool effect. So people can stand up here and they could view the entire feature. Now, if I'm gonna break this up to see how long all of this is, this is approximately 35 feet long. So it's not a huge pond, but it's pretty big. Coming all the way out, keep it on the outside over here. So that's about 35 feet. Maximum width. So from this point, all the way out over to here, this is gonna be about 20 feet. The pump area, approximately eight feet, and then it's gonna be by 10. And this is not to scale. If I wanted to have a really, really, really accurate drawing, I would actually do a scale drawing of the area. This is still conceptual, but for us, that's really all I need because we're building it. This is more conceptual. It allows me to order all the materials, and that's really the stuff that I wanna to talk to you today about. 35 by 20, eight by 10, little pumping area. Then we have this little section over here. So this, it's about 15 feet, and then it's about 10 foot wide. So if I were to add all of these up, 15, um, 35, and 10, I'm at 60 feet. So I have 60 total feet for my entire pond. 60 feet long, 20 feet wide. The depth, it's gonna be fairly shallow, 30 inches, maybe maximum at this point. Um, and again, the idea, just like the Everglades, it's not a huge giant lake system. This is a shallow moving ecosystem. It's gonna be there for fish, it's gonna be there for reptiles, it's gonna have all that different aquatic habitat. And so that's the main point of all this stuff. In order to figure out the stones, these are some of the numbers that I need. I wanna measure up the actual shoreline. If you were gonna do this exactly, scale drawing is the best, you would actually literally measure the entire perimeter um, and get an actual number. So that's by far the most accurate. For what I'm trying to do here, I'm gonna show you a quick little way um, that I use to come up with this number. So what I do, I take my 60 and my 20, so those are maximum dimensions. I'm gonna multiply 60 times two because I'm going 60 feet on one side of the shoreline, 60 feet on the other. Now I know it kind of goes in and out, irrelevant right now for these numbers. So I'm gonna take 60 times two, that's 120. Then I'm gonna take 20 by two because my maximum dimension for that liner is gonna be 20 foot wide and 20 foot wide. 20 times two is 40. So I have, what is that, 160 linear feet. Now that's if it was a perfect rectangle. So that would be a perfect rectangle, 60 foot by 20 foot. What we have obviously is something that's completely different that's inside of that. So I want to get that measurement. So what I want to do is I'm going to take that number of 160 feet and I'm going to multiply it by 0.75. So that gives me 120 linear feet of shoreline going all the way around that perimeter. Now, you could adjust that number. So right now I'm coming up with 120 feet. That's basically for the drawing that I have here. So if I took that same number, 160 times 0.85, that gives me more shoreline. That goes up to 136. I might actually adjust it now by looking at this because I have these really big sweeps and stuff. What I normally do is I'll kind of try a series of different numbers. So we have 135 approximate feet of shoreline. Again, this is not an exact science. These are just uh, some of the tips and tricks that I've learned over the years to allow me to come up with some of these uh, numbers relatively quickly. The amount of stone that I'm gonna use, my labor calculations, etc. So now the reason I'm getting this, because for every foot, of that shoreline, we're gonna cover it up with stone. So we wanna know how much stone that's gonna take. So if I were to look at this a little bit differently, so my excavation is gonna go down approximately 18 to 24 inches around that initial edge. So I'm gonna be digging everything down. I need to put a rock right in here. My soil is over on this side. My water level is over here. So this level, this rock, I need to know how many tons of stone are going in place. So let's say that this rock from here all the way down to the bottom is 24 inches. The reason I chose 24 is I want the rock above my soil 
and the bottom section of the rock is actually going to be buried in river stone. So the actual area that you're actually going to see underwater is actually going to be 16 inches or so. So I want to make sure that some of that rock, I have the necessary amount below gravel as well as above. So I'm going to say 24 inches. We have 135 feet. We have a rock that's 24 inches, so times two feet. That's going to give us the face feet. Now what we need to do is we have to figure the depth of the stone. So how thick are those stones? If I were creating a massive pond, um, the one here at our office, I have some huge rocks that are five, six, eight feet wide. On a pond of this scale, that would take up a significant portion of the pond. So I'm not, I don't need to go, no, go that big. So this rock is gonna be approximately 24 inches tall. Maybe only, again, this is an average. We'll say it's about um, one, one and a half feet. So 18 inches, 1.5 feet. 135 times two times 1.5. That's gonna give me 405 cubic feet. 405 cubic feet. Now what we need to do is we need to get that number into um, actual stone. So now what's interesting about stone is there's different types of rock. A very common stone that we use here in the Chicagoland area is what we call a Wisconsin granite. 165 pounds per cubic foot. The stone that we're gonna be using down in Florida, it's a conglomerate type stone. And what I mean by that, this is the ancient seabed. So it's a combination of sand and shells and corals and all the stuff that has been compressed over time, as well as uh, calcium carbonate that is precipitated out of the seawater has kind of turned it into a block of concrete, but it's not solid. It's not like granite. Granite is a metamorphic stone. So it has been crushed under great pressure, uh, depth, temperatures uh, to really create a highly crystalline structure of the stone itself. This rock that we're doing in Florida, completely different, more porous, a lot more lighter. That's gonna uh, manipulate that number significantly and I'm gonna show you that. But I'm gonna guess it's probably 135 to 140 pounds per cubic foot. So I wanna take 405 times 140 pounds per cubic foot. So 56,000 pounds of stone. So I'm gonna divide that by 2,000 to get it into tons because we're talking about larger quantities. I order it by the ton. One ton has 2,000 pounds of stone in it. So 28 tons of, uh, of stone. So that's a significant amount. 28.35 tons. Now, if I were to go with that uh, granite number that I was talking about, 405 times 165 divided by 2,000, 33 tons. So that adds up. That's uh, five tons different. And when you're talking about weight of stone, that's actually a pretty good percentage because it takes a long time for men to pick up and move stone. So if you're moving stone by hand, the calculations that I use is one man will move one ton of rock per hour. That's moving it from the pile, placing it inside the, st uh, inside the excavation, and then going out and grabbing more. So that's one person. So I could figure out the number of men that I have on the project and I could actually calculate how long it takes to do it. So what we have, we're going with 28 tons. This is the stone just for this top edge. Then what we have to do is we have to figure out the area for the stone that's going inside the pond. Because remember I said the pond right now, this top edge is only uh, 18 inches or so deep. We're going down approximately 30 inches deep. So we have a whole nother shelf area that's getting dug down, down into the bottom of the pond. We have 28 tons of stone going in so far. So now what I wanna do is I'm gonna figure out, again, that top edge uh, that I have going around. Now I'm gonna figure out that deep section. So I'm gonna sweep this deep area right underneath that deck. Then it'll kind of sweep out, kind of mimic almost the shape that we have. So now what I want to do is I want to figure out that shoreline for this area. So that excavation area. So I need to know how far it is from here to here and from here to here. So we'll say this whole section is 25 feet and then we're 20 foot wide. So we'll say it's 15. So we'll say this whole area is 25 by 15. Now what we'll do is we'll figure out that shoreline number again. So I have to go with 25 feet times two, 15 times two. I have 80 feet. If it was a square, remember that was that number. This is irregular. So again, I'm gonna take 80%, 85%, so times 0.85, so 68 feet. 68 linear feet. Now what we have to do is we have to go back to that. 24 inches, how big are those rocks that we're gonna be doing? Now with this one, down in the bottom of the pond, 
probably not going to go with one massive rock. I usually go with smaller stuff. It's more cost effective and it's quicker and easier for us to do the installation. So what I'll do is I'll probably figure a couple small rocks and I'll do some gravel behind it. And then I'll set another big rock up here on top of it. So it'll kind of be more of a staircase type of an effect for this section. So it's actually very, very cost effective to do something like that. We're gonna be approximately, again, 24 inches. It's not gonna be 1.5. Actually, these rocks are gonna probably be closer to a foot. Times only one, obviously, so that's 68 cubic feet. Now we're gonna take that number, multiply it by 140 pounds per cubic foot equals 9,520 pounds. Divide that by 2,000, 4.76 tons. So now what I do is I'm gonna add all of these numbers up to come up with my total amount of stone. So these numbers, because my measurements aren't exactly perfect, I'm just taking rough guesstimates, I'm gonna try to add a little bit more stone. And the reason I'm adding more stone is because I wanna add in some big character boulders. We have 28 tons, 4.76. Now I'm gonna add in a few extra tons. The reason I wanna do that is because this peninsula is kind of in a high, high viewing area. This section over here, same thing. So I'm gonna set in a couple big giant boulders. So as you're looking across, it gives us a little bit of topography change. It kind of creates a little bit of a statement. I want the rocks, instead of just barely coming up above the edge, I want them coming up above the water. 12, 18, even 24 inches. So I want some serious, serious stone. So when I figure those, it doesn't fit with these calculations. I'm adding it on top of everything. Even something right here on the edge of this deck come in with a couple big boulders. And then at these little areas, these coves in between, are actually gonna be filled with aquatic vegetation. So the reason I'm doing that is Florida is relatively flat, so I don't, want, I don't want to create mountains or anything like that. So I want to have a little bit of drama, but not anything out outrageous. So that other area in between, I want to fill with aquatic vegetation, those little coves, and that's because I want to kind of blend the area between the water and the land. So I want rock, some big rock outcroppings, and then I want to disappear that edge um, with a lot of aquatic vegetation. So this will be all vegetation back over in this area, and then this will be terrestrial plantings on the back side of it. So that's gonna create this really kind of a, almost that Everglades type of a look, which is predominantly vegetation. Right over here, um, where I have these big boulders, this will actually probably be a higher elevation. So I might kind of create a little bit of a knoll area, so a little bit higher. That will allow us to plant some other unique plant species and things like that in that section. So again, I'm trying to create everything. This is a destination area. I want people to kind of look at all these different spots. Waterfall is gonna come in over in this section. All of that water is gonna flow down to our intake bay. All right, so we're in back of our warehouse right now, and I pulled out a few stones to illustrate the different sizes that are available. This is a hard, very dense stone. This is another granite piece. Very, very, very hard. This one is sandstone. If I hit this, you can actually see it starting to chip away and break. This is a sedimentary rock. This is a metamorphic rock. This is much lighter. This is closer in weight to the stuff that we're going to be using down at Iguana Land. But I wanted to show you some of the different sizes that are available. You can see here, this is approximately 18 inches tall. So what I was talking about inside was one cubic foot of stone, 12 inch by 12 inch by 12 inch cube of this material. It's going to weigh about 140 to 150 pounds of sandstone. The material down in Florida, closer to 140 pounds. The lighter the stone is, it actually stretches out and it goes further. Granites, you're gonna have a very condensed rock. And the reason I'm talking about this is it'll completely throw your calculation off by as much as 25 to 30%. That's a significant difference when you're talking about the purchase of the stone that could cost several hundred dollars per ton. So you have to understand how much stone you need, what type of stone that you're working with, and then how long it takes to put them in. So I hope you found some of these calculations, all this information of our, all the experience that we have of doing projects all over the world useful. And I look forward to seeing you down in Iguana Land.